Okay, I'd like you to take a look at this set and try to answer the question, is he training hard enough to maximize muscle growth? Let's just skip ahead to the last two reps here. One whitey, and flex the way come up. God damn it! Yeah. 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 yeah All right, I hope that's an easy one, right? There might be a few masochists who'd argue he could have grinded another rep, but I think most people would easily agree that Ed Corney squeezed every last drop of gains out of that set. But what about this set? This one's a bit trickier. Is Jay training hard enough to maximize growth here? Now, for a bit of context, I measured how long it took him to complete the positive, or concentric, phase of each rep. The first rep took him 0.57 seconds to complete, and that stays pretty steady throughout the set. And then you'll notice that as he gets to these last couple of reps here, they take 0.7 seconds and then 1.03 seconds to complete. So was that set to failure? Could he have gone harder? Should he have gone harder? Well, let's start with what the science has to say about that first question. According to this paper from Fisher and Steele, muscular failure is when, despite the greatest effort, a person is unable to meet and overcome the demands of the exercise, causing an involuntary set endpoint. So basically you don't just stop because it feels hard, you stop when your muscles are physically incapable of producing enough force to move the weight. Now, practically speaking, coaches tend to break this up into two categories. There's absolute failure, which is when you just can't move the weight even if you change your form or get other muscles involved. And there's technical failure, which is when you can't do another rep with the same form. So once your form is altered, that would be failure. Now, most coaches tend to prefer the technical failure definition because it just feels wrong to define failure as going all out at any cost, even if you break technique. But there's a problem with this technical definition too. The reality is that as you push toward failure, especially on free weight exercises, your form will change to some degree. So if we allow zero technique breakdown, we risk terminating the set well before the target muscle has reached its full force generating potential. Oh, what a loser! So I personally like to define failure somewhere in the middle. A little form deviation is okay if it helps you crank out those extra few reps to really reach muscular failure, but once you start creating a whole new exercise just to move the weight, you're stretching the definition of failure too far. Also, since it's easier to keep form consistent on most machines, I don't think we should tolerate as much, if any, form deviation there. Now, some researchers have started to investigate failure in terms of rep speed slowdown. Basically, as you get closer to failure, the concentric will move more slowly as you grind out those last few reps. For example, this 2019 study found that on the bench press exercise, once subjects got halfway through the set, the reps had already slowed down by 30%. And then on the last possible rep, the weight was moving about 80% slower. Now it's important to note that how much rep slowdown you see as you approach failure is highly individual and will be different for different exercises. Still, if the reps don't slow down at all, you're most likely not at failure yet, at least not using my definition. And if the reps have started to slow noticeably, you could be getting at least somewhat close. So coming back to Jay, no, I definitely don't think this set was to failure. I think he could have done at least two or three more reps with still good enough form. So yeah, he definitely could have gone harder, but does that mean he should have gone harder? Well, before we try to answer that question, it's important to cover a bit of scientific background and a few more examples from in the trenches. So as far as I can tell, there are two main approaches people take to figure out if they're pushing hard enough, and they both have some science base. The first is the simplest approach. You just go all the way to failure every time, or at least most of the time. This way, you simply don't need to worry about accidentally undershooting your effort. Now, a lot of people in our science-based niche are quick to call this overzealous meathead training, but I think it's actually fairly reasonable in some contexts, and it does have some science base. I mean, you can find peer-reviewed literature suggesting that people should train to the highest intensity of effort, thus recruiting as many motor units and muscle fibers as possible. However, this recommendation is always couched within a low volume, single set to failure paradigm. So I think this every set to failure approach is a viable option for people who are very limited on time and want to get in an efficient training stimulus for the lowest possible time investment. However, I'm confident this style of training isn't optimal, especially over the long term. And that's because you're forced to keep weekly volume, or the number of sets you do, very low when taking a lot of sets to failure. And we also know from a pretty large body of science that on average, more volume leads to more muscle growth, at least up to a point. This is a figure from a meta-analysis led by James Krieger, where you can see that of the 15 studies included, 11 are to the right of the center line, meaning those studies favored higher volumes. If there was truly no impact of volume on muscle growth, you'd expect to see more studies like this one to the left, and there'd be a much more random distribution around the center. But that's not the case. 
the overall average effect clearly favors higher volume. Now, to make this more tangible, when you break it down in terms of the number of sets per muscle per week, it's clear that doing at least 10 sets per muscle per week is better than doing five to nine sets or doing less than five sets. Now, I can already hear a bodybuilder somewhere saying, but Jeff, the muscle only knows failure. But we know this isn't true. A brand new systematic review and meta-analysis from Gergich and colleagues, which pulled the results of 15 studies and about 400 participants, found that similar increases in muscle size can be attained regardless of whether or not training is carried out to muscle failure. We also know from other research that those final two reps before failure are disproportionately more fatiguing, which is not good from a recovery standpoint. Now, obviously this does depend on the exercise. Failure on a set of lateral raises isn't nearly as fatiguing as failure on a set of deadlifts, but on a per set basis, going all the way to failure is clearly harder to recover from. So if we can get the same hypertrophic stimulus with less recovery demand and can do more weekly volume by not going to failure, the solution is simple we need to find a way of quantifying how hard we're training without needing to take every set to failure. And that brings me to the second, and in my opinion, more optimal approach to this question, which is getting really good at using RPE and RIR. Now, before I show you some real life examples, give me 30 seconds on the beach to explain these concepts for those who don't know. So RPE stands for rating of perceived exertion, and it just ranks how hard your set was on a scale of one to 10. RIR stands for reps in reserve, so it's how many reps you left in the tank. So if you had an RP of 10, that means you reached failure and you had zero reps in reserve. If you had an RP of nine, that means you had one rep left in reserve. That would be the same as saying one RIR. If you had an RP of eight, that means you had two reps left in reserve and so on. Now it's still being hotly debated just how many reps you can leave in the tank and still maximize hypertrophy. And in my opinion, this is the million dollar question right now. For example, on the low end, some experts like Dr. Mike Zordos seem to be comfortable setting the threshold pretty low, at least in certain contexts. Having said that, you can grow just fine, maybe five to seven reps from failure. So that'd be a true RPE of three to five. Dr. Eric Helms has recommended zero to five reps in reserve. So an RPE of five to 10 is a good range for hypertrophy. While others like Dr. Brad Schoenfeld seem to set the bar a bit higher, having recently made recommendations in the one to three reps in reserve range. So an RPE of seven to nine, and maybe take the last set or two to failure on certain exercises just to be safe. I think that these can all make sense depending on the context. For example, if you're training with sufficiently heavy weight, I think you can get a solid hypertrophic stimulus by leaving four or five reps in the tank. That's because you should activate most motor units from the first rep of the set, especially if you're a more advanced trainee. However, if you're doing lighter weight, say something over 12 to 15 reps, you really shouldn't be leaving more than one to two reps in the tank tops. But there's an obvious issue here. This RPE or RIR method is highly subjective. And if you suck at guessing how many reps you have left in the tank, you do risk falling below that bottom end threshold. This is why in another video, I touched on the importance of doing anchoring sets. If you haven't done this lately or ever, actually do it the next time you train. Pick an exercise that you can fail safely on and go all out with good form. Call out when you think you've got two reps left in the tank. That's RP eight. And then keep pushing to see what it feels like to truly go to an RP of 10 and to find out how close you were with your called rating. Another way to get better at this is using rep speed, which is gaining a lot of momentum in the research lately. One group of researchers even developed a set of equations that can predict how many reps you have left in reserve using velocity loss within a set. So in theory, we can use their data in this table to predict that if you're doing a set of bench press with 80% of your max and the reps have slowed by half, so 50%, you should still have 1.6 reps left in the tank. So one to two reps in reserve. And while I know some powerlifters have started using rep speed trackers in training, I think most of us should apply this research more broadly for now. One thing I think we can all benefit from doing is simply recording a set, watching it back and observing how the rep speed changes toward the end. If you don't notice the reps slow down at all, you may not be pushing it as hard as you think you are, even if it feels quite challenging in your head. So let's start with an example from me. This is a set of 11 reps that I did with Eric Helms and we were aiming for an RPE of eight. What was the RPE? Call that an eight. An eight? Yeah. Is it less than an eight? <laughs> it might, might have been a seven and a half. <laughs> Actually, now that I'm watching this back, I think it was more like an RPE of six, maybe seven. So the first rep took 0.8 seconds. The second rep was 0.9 seconds. We'll fast forward these middle reps and jump to rep nine, which took 1.1 seconds. So it is slowing down a bit. Here is rep 10, which took 1.13 seconds. So about the same speed there. And then here's my last attempted rep, which took 1.23 seconds. So when I do it the math, that's 28% velocity loss from the first or fastest rep to the last rep. 
And if, just for fun, we round that up to 30% and plug it into the squat data from the Rodriguez-Russell study, that would correspond to 3.5 reps in reserve, assuming this set was around 70% of my one rep max, which I think is fair. So 3.5 reps in reserve would be an RPE of six or seven, not eight. Now, I honestly don't think we can extrapolate this data across exercises like this, so I'm just gonna keep it in mind, but ultimately put it away for the next few examples we'll cover. And while I definitely wouldn't call this a useless set, especially when doing multiple sets, in my opinion, I probably should have done another one or two reps to get in that RPE eight zone. Okay, next let's see an example of what zero reps in reserve, or RPE 10, really looks like. This is a set from men's classic physique champ, Chris Bumstead. So let's pay attention to how his rep speed changes throughout the set. So he's just finishing rep four here. So this is rep five and we're at 1.27 seconds. Rep six is 1.23 seconds. Rep seven, a bit of a grind, 1.9 seconds, but he's still going. At rep eight, we're at 1.9 seconds again. Now rep nine is considerably slower at 2.5 seconds. Now here is his last rep, much slower, a full 3.2 seconds. And I think that's it. I don't think he could have got another rep without a lot of help from his spotter. Now playing this back, I personally would save this level of exertion for the last set of an exercise, or you could even stop two reps shy of where Chris did to mitigate fatigue a bit, and then push like this in the last week of a training phase. But I still think this was a beautifully executed set to zero RIR, or maybe slightly beyond if you think his spotter helped a bit on those last few reps there. All right, so let's see an example of what one rep in reserve really looks like. Now, in my opinion, this is where a good chunk of your training should be if your main goal is to maximize hypertrophy. So this is a set of six reps by IFBB pro John Meadows. Let's watch. Oh yeah, easy. Easy. Let's go. Come on, two more. Yeah, one more. Nice. Easy. So yeah, watching this back, you can see John has a very explosive tempo and pretty consistent rep speed throughout the set. And then he starts to hit the wall more abruptly on these last couple reps here. But based on this last rep speed, I'd say he could have done one more rep with a big grind, but no more than that. Okay, next let's look at an RPE seven to eight set. So leaving two to three reps in reserve. This is a set of eight reps from IFBB pro Kai Green. So these first few reps are moving really smooth and consistent. I think he's getting a little boost from his spotter, but judging by the bar speed of these last few reps here, it looks to me like he had another two, maybe three reps in the tank. And of course, I think this is a perfectly stimulative working set, especially given the load he's moving. Okay, next I wanna look at a set that probably isn't stimulative enough to maximize hypertrophy, so a set to an RPE of five or less. Now, of course, there are tons of examples of Ronnie Coleman going to an RPE 10 and beyond. I personally think he's the greatest bodybuilder of all time, and no one in their right mind would argue that Ronnie didn't train hard enough. Hey, wait, baby! But as an exception to the rule, I did wanna look at this set of pull downs because this is the type of set you see all the time where someone calls it off before they get anywhere near a failure. Now, this could have been a warm up set for Ronnie and he might've done 20 more sets after this, I'm not sure. But on a per set basis, I would say this proximity to failure would be insufficiently stimulative for the average person to maximize hypertrophy. And judging by these last few reps here, I would say he still had another five to 10 reps left in the tank. No real rep speed slowdown, no real grindy reps. Now, by contrast, here's the last three reps on a set of pulldowns from natural pro Alberto Nunez to a true RPE of nine or 10. Notice how he doesn't break technique at all and really grinds out the concentric on this last rep here, which takes a full 4.17 seconds to complete. And I would say this is perfect effort for the last set of back on a pull day. Okay, now let's take a look at a set that I would say is, in my opinion, too much effort. So this is a recent set of five reps from IFBB pro Greg Doucette. Now I know Greg's working around an injury and hasn't squat in a while, so keep that in mind. But I did wanna include this because I think it illustrates another type of set that we see very often, which is when you feel the need to push to an RPE of 10, even when it comes at a higher risk and recovery cost. So my two cents on this set would be to strip the weight back, start at something around an RPE seven, and then over the coming weeks, as you get more locked in with the technique, gradually ramp the RPE up over time. Or if you really wanna take a set to an RPE 10 like this, which certainly does have its place, I just save it for a machine or isolation exercise or until you get the form more dialed in again. Now, by contrast, here's a hard set of six reps on the squat from Matt Ogus that leaves one, maybe two reps in the tank. And we jumped in here on rep three of six just to save time. So this is rep four right here. Now, in my opinion, this is a more effective, but still very hard set. 
you'll notice his technique is completely dialed in, and while he isn't breaking his back trying to get the weight up, you can still see the reps slowing down as he gets closer to the end of the set here. Now he pauses on this last rep, which you'll see, and that makes the concentric a bit slower, but I still think this is the perfect example of an RPE 8 or 9 set that should still probably come toward the end of a training cycle. Okay, and lastly I want to look at a few examples that seem to break the rules. First, let's look at this set of deadlifts from Steffi Cohen, and I want you to watch this first rep closely. Okay, I'm going to pause it there. Actually, let's watch it back again. Okay, so after that first rep, do you think she's got another rep in the tank, or is this RPE 10 already? Let's see. So here's rep two, and rep three, and this is rep four, and rep five. I'm just gonna keep going. Rep six, she's not done yet. That's rep number seven, and she's still got more. This is rep eight, still going. Rep nine is finally starting to slow down a bit, and I think she's gonna go for one more here. So this one is a big grind, almost a five second rep, and she's done. So yeah, that would have been really hard to gauge based on that first rep speed. So just keep that in mind. You can't always just look at a single rep in isolation and determine RIR based on that alone. There are big individual differences with this. Okay, here's another example of when it's hard to gauge RIR based on rep speed. So this is a set of elevated dumbbell squats from IFBB Pro Sunny Andrews, where she's using a strong mind-muscle connection, constant tension, and a very smooth tempo on both the positive and the negative. For the other examples we covered, I picked lifts that use a more explosive tempo on the positive because that's how the reps are performed in the studies I mentioned. But if you're purposefully modifying the concentric tempo and really emphasizing the mind-muscle connection, it does make it a lot harder to judge reps in reserve using rep speed. So with all this information in mind, let's come back to this set from Jay at the beginning. Was this set hard enough to maximize muscle growth? I think yes. Even though he may not have seen as much rep speed slow down as some of the other examples, after watching hours of his training footage, I've noticed that despite his more explosive tempo, Jay seems to also use a very strong mind-muscle connection and a more consistent cadence on his reps which means I suspect he's one of those lifters that makes the weight look really easy, and then when they hit the wall, it happens more abruptly. So yeah, I think this set would be maximally stimulative for hypertrophy, even for the average person lifting much lighter absolute loads. But since this is an evolving area of research and discussion, I wanna also leave the question open and pass it off to you guys. How many reps do you think he had in the tank? And was he close enough to failure? As always, I hope you guys found the video helpful, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.